You're going to remember this every day for the rest of your life. If you want to get to a goal, if you want to get to your dream, you've got to focus on all the little steps. You have to put in your time. You have to be patient and you have to enjoy the process. Whatever you're doing now, whatever you want to be great at, whatever you want to be special at, I'm sure you, you may be already be good at it, but to be extraordinary, you have to do extra. I firmly believe that we are all here for a very specific reason, to do something truly extraordinary. But what are you going to do to get there? Welcome to another episode of the Magna Method Podcast, a podcast that strives to deliver inspiring stories of hard work, perseverance, and a commitment to excellence. Today's guest is Sean Mori. Sean is a wild man, much like the fearless host Mark Magna. Sean and Mark share a very similar journey as well as many of the same experiences. These two take a trip down memory lane to let you in on a few unknown stories about the mythical work ethic it takes to make it as a professional athlete. You can find the Magna Method podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave a comment to let us know how the Magna Method podcast has influenced you. All right. So this is serious. I'm very excited. Should I say <laughs> Sean Joseph Mori? You can say whatever you want. I am very excited to have Sean Moray. <laughs> Sean Mori. Yeah, thanks. On this okay, show. Sean Mori is not only a great, great legendary athlete, but he's also oh, a true God. and dear friend. Sean is a former NFL wide receiver. He played college football at Brown. He was drafted by the New England Patriots in the seventh round of the 1999 draft. That means he's really old, old as dirt. <laughs> Sean also Five played older than you. for the Philadelphia <laughs> Eagles. Pittsburgh Steelers and Arizona Cardinals. He was fortunate to be on a Super Bowl winning team with the Steelers, and uh, they beat up on the Seattle Seahawks. And Sean was actually a captain of the team. So Sean is someone who I think the world of. He is a world class comedian. He's many things, but he's also a great human being. Thank you for being on the show on the show sean i'm so excited i'm so nervous oh, actually do i get to inter can i get to introduce you now yeah of course i love that i love that let's go um what, what did i say what did i say mark magna um uh, one of the hardest working toughest uh football players i've ever I, I can't really say played with or played against or anything like that it's just a scene i remember the play specifically and maybe this um could potentially go on a tangent, which is a. Uh, That's the nature of the business, is, uh, Sean. This is, this is where a tangent my, business. Right. Uh, so, I don't know. You, I, maybe I'll just ask you. Do you remember the play in the in the um, against Detroit that got us the ball back so that I could uh, catch a ball across the middle well, on cover two so that I could get walked down by a, yet again <laughs> so that we'd have to kick a field goal to well, win a game. Well, we're gonna get to who threw you the ball, but. Let's. Right. Let, I know exactly what the play was. I, oh my God! You, you. I think you're. Well, you, you, you explain it. I mean, I know we'll, we'll, we're kind of jumping out our gate here, like we're running a forty. No, you, you, quick. you explain the play because it means nothing if it comes from me. They're not going to believe me anyway. Well, you, you might have to. I, I remember watching from the sideline. Um, you coming off the ball, in a three point stance, um, and getting. Uh, essentially getting pancaked and getting up, racing down. Someone ear holes you, you spin off, and then you chase the quarterback down and end up getting a sack that they have to go and punt and we get the ball back. Um, and I remember uh, Coach Belichick showing that play a few you know, days later about like, you know, which where he makes the sort of the effort clips yeah, of plays right. of this is the kind of play that we expect this is the patriot way so to speak i'm not sure if those are the words he used yeah. but that's the the point he was trying to make um <sighs> well let me just stop but yeah i mean Sean. no one's going to really believe that anyway so let's we're here to talk about yeah. you. <laughs> we're here to talk about you but that gonna, was a great story a uh, yeah no one's going to believe that we're going to have to produce video evidence but thank you for saying that but let's talk about who you received. Wait, look, all right, do you remember it? Don't, no, I'm not. Gonna, I don't accept that. Do you remember that that play? Well, I, my memory's 
intact. So yes, I do. It's a it. sack. So you tell me. You tell the story. Maybe I'm. Maybe I'm. 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 Uh, you know, sort of. I, I mean, hyperbolic. You know, the, a lot of the, the the essence of the moral of the story is. You're never out of the fight. Get up off the ground. Hustle, hustle, hustle until you die. And that's in essence because Sean knows this very well and he'll second this. I am the worst athlete in the world, um, but I try real hard. So that's the reason why, I, you know, I, you know, do anything in life or try to be good, you know. Um, but Sean, who did you catch that ball from? Uh, Tom Brady, yeah. That's right. Um, and that was his first, wasn't that his first, like, literally completion in the NA? No. Uh, so earlier that preseason, um, so I, w- I was a second-year player coming back from NFL Europe. Um, and uh, Tom was a rookie, a sixth-round draft pick like yourself. And he um, he was, uh, <laughs> you know, at, like he and I never really we didn't really get any reps in practice. I mean, he was the fourth quarterback and yeah, he'd get reps. But if you think about how many reps there are in any given practice during training camp, there's only so many. And there's a lot of reps that the offensive line and the running backs and the tight ends and the first teamers and the second teamers and the guys that may or may not make the team. Like you have to assess out like which are the players that you can depend on. So, but more importantly, you have to get ready to play a season. And I think that year in particular was Coach Belichick's first year with the Patriots. And I remember us having like two straight weeks of full practice, two a days. Um, but that's beside the point. Um, the, the reality is I was like the 14th receiver <laughs> in practice. And he was the that's fourth not quarterback. True at so we didn't all. get a lot of reps in practice. And so after practice for me to get my conditioning up and get my catches in, I would we would go up and back twice doing a two minute drill. So I was catching 20 or more passes from Tom, whether it's a shallow cross or a quick out or a flag or a deep crosser or, or a cover two bender or, a, you know, a seam read versus cover two where you kind of, you, you, you let the ball shape you in towards the middle of the field on cover two. And, and against Detroit in that uh, preseason game, we identified that. So the safeties were widening in their cover two coverage. And I mentioned it to coach fears and Tom, you know, threw a dart on the next play, and I, got, I ran for my life, but got tackled on the 15, and then Venetieri kicked the game winner. So, but that wasn't the first pass that Tom threw. Tom threw a pass to me in uh, the Hall of Fame game that you season. We had five preseason games, and the first one was in Canton at the Hall of Fame I game remember. versus the uh, Niners. Yeah. Interesting story. I was standing on the sidelines, and. One of the hall, well, all the Hall of Fame inductees were on the sidelines, and um, he happened to look over me during the uh, right after the national anthem, and he looked me right in the eyes, and it was Howie Long, and oh, I wow. and I said, "Hey," <laughs> and he said, <laughs> and then he looks at me and he goes, "What's up?" <laughs> and he said, "Good luck," and I went, "Thanks," and I was thinking, I can't tell you how many times I watched Howie Long on in videos and king size hits of the nfl crunch course uh big time hits and he was like my right. hero because he was like you know a northeast guy went to villanova small school caveman and i was thinking well how long is standing right next to me it was incredible it was a very That's interesting amazing. moment and, and sean and i took a picture after that detroit game and i still have the picture remember that picture sean yeah yeah, I get the same one. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a really special picture. Hey, what, you know what's yeah. crazy? I, I, I'm surprised we never talked about this because I'm not sure of how if you would identify, um, you know, or you would, you know, say how long is like your hero, at least from you know a childhood perspective, looking at growing up watching ball. But like for me, there is no doubt. It's undoubtedly Jerry Rice. There's just there's no there's, question. And he played. He played the Niners. And after the game, um, I was just—I I didn't even realize he was coming up to me until I sort of picked my head up. And he and he put his hand out and shook my hand and said, "Hey, good job. I see what you're trying to do, and good luck. Keep keep working hard. You'll get there." And I just—I like my jaw dropped, and then he just moved on. And I was like, 
<laughs> yeah, it's incredible. That's a special moment. But 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 those guys, you know, hard work recognizes hard work and appreciates it. Certainly celebrates it and wants to see people like that. When you're the best of the best and you're a good human and you're you you're good at what you do, you want to see others rise up. And I think that's going to be a powerful part of this podcast. Like they want to see other people do well, and he recognized mm-hmm. that. And it wouldn't take long to if you watch Sean Morey to see that you want him to succeed because he's a relentless worker. He's a great human being. But, you know, you're talking about a a kid from southeastern Massachusetts who didn't come from a powerhouse football program. I certainly didn't either. But he worked his butt off and excelled, went to Brown, was like the all-time leading receiver at Brown until it was broken by someone else. But he was a legendary receiver there and was highly productive. And then he went to play in the Hula Bowl, and then he got drafted by the Patriots, the hometown team. And then he bounced around the NFL, was a captain of a Super Bowl team. I mean, this guy could tell you stories, but he's one of the most fierce competitors I've ever met, and he's he's a great, great, great human being. So let's, Sean, let's start off, like, let, tell us about, you know, your upbringing and then and how you transitioned and ended up inevitably choosing football. Well, I, I'll say I really appreciate you, you the kind words. Um, and I'm not trying to be, you know, self-deprecating, um, <laughs> but, uh, the, you know, the truth is, you know, it's interesting how everyone looks at their own career. And, you know, you can look at it and frame life or your own career or your accomplishments or even your shortcomings. And, it, and the way you frame it is really your own personal perspective. And for me, I, I, it's funny. I, I, I sort of chuckle, and I and I can appreciate where you're coming from, and 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 I understand how when people, you know, um, you know, you know, sort of, you have this unearned respect of of strangers that don't quite know what what you did, or just the fact that you played in the NFL, and they think, wow, you're only five foot ten. You must have really been good. It's like no, I was just I worked really hard, and I, you know, I I. I I was a I was a good teammate. I played hard. I practiced hard. Uh, I never let it be something I didn't do that caused me to fail. And in my mind, my perspective, you know, I had eleven catches in ten years. I wasn't exactly Steve Largent or <laughs> Wayne Trebet or even Jerry Rice. No, no. I, but you had but, an each. You had an each. You you had I, something yeah, you did I, very I, well. So so to answer your question, like you, you said, um, do you want me to start with my upbringing? Um, you know, my father was uh, was a lobsterman. He passed away in 2019. I'm so and sorry. Was, uh, thank you. It's, it's great, um, great he, man, you know, by the a, way. Every time I met him, he was such a, a, a good person and, you know, a mm-hmm. very dry sense of humor, but, but, but nice, great to me, made me laugh and uh, made people feel good ab- about who they are. But you could tell why Sean's such a good person. His father was a great human being. Yeah, and, and and I think what my my dad did was was he he connected with people with his sense of humor and his um, and his humility. He played he played football for a long time and, and was regarded as a very good um, receiver and, and semi pro football and you know in the Northeast and had opportunities to maybe try out and play for the I think at the time they were like the Rhode Island Steamrollers or, or, or and, I remember. Uh, Providence Steamrollers, and and he ended up getting drafted, and uh, and we started a family, and and my mother is a emergency room nurse, and was uh, the head of the ER at Brockton Hospital for I think maybe around 15 years. She's um, she's still living in Mass and doing really well, and uh, you know I've got a twin sister and two older brothers, and um, my my sister was the, you know the best athlete, <laughs> actually voted the best athlete in our high school. And I was always a kid that was sort of undersized and skinny, and I was a good soccer player. But when I decided to finally transition to football, because my my closest friend in high school, Jim Kelly, asked me to, uh, you know, I would I would sort of run around on the, uh, you know, um, you know, we'd play pickup football, and, and nobody could catch me. So he, he talked me into playing, and. Uh, my my first year in eighth grade, I I never touched the field. I I remember I, I was on the field. I was literally on the field for two plays my entire eighth grade season. And one I I took a uh, a toss and made one person miss with a like a sort of a dead leg move that my dad showed me, which is somewhat kind of hysterical as I think about it. And 
and I got like 15 yards, but didn't score. And then the other play, it was a night game. They they kicked the ball, it skipped off the wet grass, hit my shin, and that bounced back, and the other team recovered it, and that was it. So I was like, maybe football's not my deal, and I went back and played soccer. Um, and then I was just really frustrated that I that I'd, that I'd quit something that I could have been good at, and I decided that I'm going to go back and I'm going to be really good. And so I, when I went back, I worked. I practiced hard. I ran hard. I, I had, I had great coaches. Um, really, some of the some of the best mentors um, in the senior class, um, Sean Griffith, and you know, other 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 just amazing um, people and players and coaches. And I, I was really fortunate. Um, and uh, you know, but I learned and I got better and we competed in practice and and ultimately I. Uh, I did improve, and um, then when I, I was either going to go to Northeastern to accept a partial scholarship, or my close friend Jim Kelly was going to Hebron Academy to do a PG or so, I, I decided to go there for essentially the same amount. It would cost us, our family the same amount of money. And there, from Dave Gagnon and Moose Curtis and uh, all these just amazing coaches that primarily they had a bunch of PGs and they had one, hadn't won a game in three years and, and uh, with a lot of hockey players and other athletes. We, we ended up winning the, well, it's a class D prep school championship. We were undefeated and, and, um, and then I was recruited by some, some, some schools and the intent was to try to go to an Ivy League school. So I went to all my teachers and begged them. I said, like, listen, I'll do whatever I need to do. Just tell me what I have to do to get an A in your class. So I, I did all the extra work and I, I performed in the classroom and um, had, had opened some doors that would, would have otherwise not been there because I was somewhat of a knucklehead in high school and a class clown. And uh, and then, but, you know, I was started training. I started lifting with uh, Saul Shockett and Brad Herman. They owned a gym called All Sports. And I started doing that through high school and then in the off season um, before and in the summer times. Um, between Brown as well as the strength coach from Brown, Roger Marandino. And then um, later on, when I, we, we, when you and I were both uh, drafted and made our way to the Patriots, you know, our speed coach, Mike Morris. I mean, I, I, I would say if I had to talk about, and I know that I've, I haven't really stopped talking, but if I had to summarize, it's probably not, um, it's probably not, no, not very dissimilar than any of the other athletes or people you've had on your your show and, and talk to about like tell us about your background tell us about you know why you've maybe experienced some success and it's it's really it's it's a it's it's the collective efforts of a group of highly um highly trained and and well-intended people that contributed to my development and that these are coaches these are athletes teammates and other people that were investing in me and I was just the beneficiary of, of like, and this is not, this is not like false humility. This is like people are made by other people. And you and I both know when we start getting into this, I know we're going to talk about the Tom YMCA and, you know, oh, yeah. iron sharpens oh, yeah. iron oh, yeah. and trying to compete with Mark Magna at five or 6 AM. Oh, bro. Um, and a Tom, no, you know, you know, you can say whatever you want to say. But I know you're full of it. If you think that I'm going to let you off the hook by <laughs> pretending like you weren't like an absolute monster, and uh, you know, you showed me, you taught me, you know, you know how how do people know like what they're capable of? Like it's really it's really kind of a, like this anomaly. It's, it fascinates me. Like how do you actually figure out how much you're able, your body is able to do? And I think that some of the first times I, I started to really, I mean, I did a lot in college and I trained really hard in high school and I, I did more than any other teammate. I, I can say that pretty confidently, but I have never worked harder than I had when I had to compete with you. Well, likewise, Sean, training. likewise, likewise. Very, very, the most grueling, brutal. By the way, we'll, well, let me cover this first. So why don't we... Well, let's get into that in a second. But Sean and yeah. I yeah, I'll know let, I'll each let other. You keep us organized. Well, well, yeah, no. Sean, <laughs> Sean and I, I had no idea who Sean was, but we did play. I knew he was a very good player. Um, I didn't know him personally, but I know he was a very good player uh, from Marshfield High School. Um, 
Durfee, my high school, played against them. Um, you know, oh, my Chris my junior yeah. schooled me. <laughs> my junior, I had to cover him in defense, <laughs> and he just he made me look like a, a five year old. <laughs> he made everyone look like a five year old. Chris right. was an outstanding basketball player for my high school. He was yeah. ahead of his time, and uh, he has an interesting story as well. But we played against each other in football, and Sean was very fast. And I think my junior year, yeah, my junior year, no, our sophomore year we played them. We didn't play them as juniors. We played his sophomore year, and I actually got my, like, first official sack, like, like a great one. And then the game was over. However, they were going to line up and kick a field goal. Well, a kid hit like a 50-yard field goal. I couldn't believe he hit it in the ring, and they beat us. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then our senior year, Sean, um, he caught a unbelievable pass down the sidelines for a score. And then at the beginning of the second half, he did the same thing. And I was thinking, geez, like it's like, no one's even out there like guarding this guy or, you know, Ding him up. We yeah. ended up winning that game. I don't know how, because Sean probably had 300 yards of receiving, but the. No, it was a punt return. Was it? Was it a, was it a punt return yeah. or a kickoff? It was the punt return. You're, no, no, no you. Return. And then a kickoff return. No, no, it was, it was, a, it was a catch and then a, a punt return. But the punt All return, I know is that he I remember scored you twice. the first one down because I have a picture of you somewhere. <laughs> oh, somewhere, and they, oh, you're saying that and you ran by me. You ran what by me. Did you is that what you're school? saying? You're leading into? I didn't run by you. I just, uh, I, I oh, thankfully, boy. thank God I avoided being decapitated. No, no, by no. Somehow. What we're going to do is we're going to make sure that this whole thing gets chopped out because I don't want to look that bad, right? So we're going to cut this whole thing. That's how this works, Sean. You know that. Okay. All right. So all anyway, right, right. he. The point is, Sean. They goes, didn't call a penalty. You you were blocked in the back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So Sean goes to prep school. Goes to Brown. Has an outstanding career. We both find ourselves in the Patriots, and uh, I, I met Sean at the Hula Bowl. We played in the Hula Bowl together, and we had a blast. I was so excited because I knew someone there, and we clicked. We had a lot of the similar blue collar black background from Massachusetts. And then we're on the Patriots. We needed to find an edge to improve and hold our own. And that edge was Mike Morris. And Sean's going to explain who Mike Morris is and what those workouts entailed. Oh, oh, oh. Mike is, um, you know, one of the, you know, the four brothers, uh, Jamie and Joe Morris. Um, and I, 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 I apologize. I, I don't know his. Well, the brother, but they were actually um, they ran at Syracuse as a uh, as a four by one hundred. These guys were like some of the fastest people on the planet during the time. And Mike was a speed coach for the Patriots. And when we when I was drafted there, I got to work with them. And then when you um, were uh, signed by the Pats, we worked with them in the, during the season. But then in the off season, and especially. And uh, the year or two after that, when you and I had been released, uh, or at least I, I'm not, I think it was, it was either the off season or like I, getting ready for NFL Europe. But I, I know that I was, I, I was, I did not have a job and we were throwing with Mark Hartzell and we were oh, um, yeah. working right. out and Mike was helping us train and, uh, and obviously, and, and uh, Kerry Carter would, Join us sometimes, but typically it was you and I that you'd get there at five, like you. I'm sure your car was running, but from like five, you know, four forty-five to five thirty until when I was supposed to be there. And I'm always getting there the second before we're supposed to start and huffing it in there and changing my sneakers and you know running through the snow. And you just rolling your eyes like, oh my god, can you just be Lombardi time, buddy? <laughs> and <laughs> and Mike just a good guy easy going but you know and um you know mike's smile was just light up a room right and his sense of humor but he just like the amount of information and expertise and training people was like unparalleled something i've never i had never seen and i still have never come across but like 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 ankle stability and jumping and donkey kicks and you know all this all the cossacks and duck walks and spider-mans and oh my goodness 
I mean, it would burn our legs. It would, you know, and then you could do these like, it was almost like spirit training. Forget, forget about like, you know, speed training. We were, we were essentially, it was like uh, American Flyer. You ever see that movie, American Flyer, where he was on the, on the treadmill? You're giving yeah. away your age, man. Giving away your age. <laughs> like, like, no one's going to even know what you're talking I know exactly what you're hey, talking about. But the, I don't the, even the, care. Go rent the go Our rent audience doesn't. From they, they, Blockbuster in they, Alaska. They have no whatever. access to VHS tape, Sean. I, I refuse to believe that. <laughs> there's a way uh but anyway like it, it was it would it was a um it was a test of uh of, it was it was what we needed it was um he kicked our butts and uh and for me i i took those, those training that training with me throughout my entire career there wasn't a week that went by during the regular season or off season and leading up to training camp that I wasn't like devotedly, um, I'm sorry, devotedly um, adhering to like, like uh, I, I would use those workouts and those exercises to supplement all my training, all my lifting before. Um, and so, and on the days off, like, like all this fast beat and, and stuff. Um, it, it helped me. It, it, I, I would go as far to say that if I hadn't met Mike Morris, my 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 career would have uh, certainly would would I wouldn't have had the multiple chances to come back and play and compete at the level that I did, and I probably wouldn't have made it in the NFL. Well, that's saying a lot, right? I mean, I, I know that between Sean Morey, Kerry Taylor, who was a All American tight end from the University of Massachusetts, right. who was also on the Patriots, you know. Um, Sean. Right, Kerry. Oh my gosh, but Kerry Carter was yeah. a running back from Toronto. That oh, was yeah, right. our, our, he was right. with our uh, football camp up there. I mean, yeah, go ahead. No, Kerry but um, they, mo- they were very, very challenging workouts. And the, the thing I'll tell you is, you didn't see a lot of guys doing that. Now you see a lot of it, but you didn't see a lot of that um, at the time. And in part, in part because some guys were so beat up, they didn't want to go through that. They wanted to rest their bodies. The other thing was like a lot of people didn't want to put that type of work in. And those were absolute brutal sessions that we would invite people in. You'd never see them again. Like no one wanted to put <laughs> themselves through that. And I can I can name names. Like, you know, yep. it was super challenging, and I was fried. And when you get done with that, you're not exactly you know. We, at times we would do some lifting either before or after, but your day was shot. But um, di- didn't it make football seem easy? Well, that's just it, you know, like I think that um, like knowing that it was um, it was so, so challenging when you got out on the football field, you felt light, you were flying around and there's a certain anyone who's ever played football knows that you could condition all day in a track. But once you put those pads on, things change. And when we mm-hmm. put the pads on, we were so well conditioned that we were able to focus on the actual techniques the scheming, uh, Sean's routes, the defensive scheme for myself, whatever it was. And that was a huge advantage, huge advantage. Mm-hmm. So, I agree. You so, can't so, play the game tired. No, 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 you can't. So, Sean, we leave. You, 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 you're you, there. Uh, let, let's talk about the story with the Patriots, um, you know, your your departure from the Patriots, what you, you were doing in between, and the story about how you got picked up and – it's just one of the best stories ever. Um, so please. Oh God, uh, I feel like you're cueing me on something, and there's I mean, how many, how many, I was cut like eight, I was cut eight times over about five years. I went to NFL Europe twice as a receiver, once as a corner, and then a third time I went um, because uh, I, w- I had been cut from the Eagles, and it was up in. And, this, and I'm gonna I'm gonna come back in a second to talk about the Patriots, but at this time, um, you know, I, we're in I'm in Montreal, uh, and um, you know, running my dog up and down Montreal, watching you play for the Alouette Mont- Montreal Alouette. Oh yeah, that's and, right. Can I say that right? Montreal Alouette's close enough. Come on, you can say it in French. <laughs> it will be here all day. I'll feel miserably. <laughs> All right, so, um, 
and so the Damian Douglas, the, the the special teams wide receiver for the Eagles, was released. He went, he or he wasn't released. He signed a free agent contract with Kansas City, and I was about to go to Los Angeles to play for the Avengers. Um, um, uh, oh, what's his word? Greg? Oh, I'm forgetting his name, but I'm what a just an awesome dude. I was going to room with this. Um, Greg Hopkins, a great player for the Avengers in Arena Football, one of the best in the league. And um, you know, I was I was figured, you know what, I'm just going to go out and play football and enjoy the rest of my career. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to make it the NFL. Or and I couldn't convince Jim Pop to sign me for the Alouettes. So I'm like, I'm just going to go play. But when Damian signed with Kansas City, I figured, you know what, maybe it's a chance that there's an op- opening. So I called Scott Cohen from the, the Eagles and, and essentially begged them to send me back to NFL Europe for a third time. And that was the year that I ended up making it in 2003 and playing essentially like 33 games straight, played in NFL Europe and then the preseason and then the regular season and then three games in the playoffs. We lost against Carolina and they went on to play <laughs> the Patriots in the Super Bowl. Um, but before that, um, when I was released from the Patriots, before I went to the Eagles, I was, um, I think it was 2001. That was Coach Belichick's second season, if I'm correct. Yes. And um, so the f- the first year he, you know, I, I, I didn't make the team. I was cut, but I was brought back and put on the practice squad. And then, um, um, and uh and then I, I, I ended up. I was going to be. I was going to start against Monday, against uh, on Monday night game against Kansas City. And right before, he, and he, we weren't going to do the roster moves until the Friday. And and but I had known all week. I've been practicing. I was going to be. The, um, uh, oh, actually, you know what? I just messed up. Can I back up here? I know that we'll have to. You don't have to edit it, but so the it was in two thousand that I was released from the Patriots, and I decided. Um, I decided that I wasn't going to get a real job yet. Yeah. Uh, so I decided John, to. Yes. And, and, I, <laughs> so and I, decided I think I tried to tell him he needs a job. He's like, but you told me I can't get a job. Do you remember why you told me you couldn't get a job? And as soon as you told me that, it made perfect sense. But do you remember well, why you told to, me? I wanted to train. Well, he said he wanted to train, but he also said, once I get a real job, Mark, that means oh, yeah. I've, I've given, given up. up. And if Absolutely. I if I get a real job, I just can't give up because I know I have a lot left in me. And everyone and their mother was telling Sean, you got to grow up, give it up and get a real job. I mean, everyone was telling him that. OK, so mm-hmm. he refused to do that. And Sean, please. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you know, what? there's so many. Um, there are a lot of uh, side parts of the story, to sort of the, tra- the trajectory of my career, because there's highs and lows and. There's a lot of rabbit holes, but I'll, I'll digress and we'll go back to 2000. And so I'm, I'm cut from the Patriots and I'm delivering furniture for Muldoon's trucking. And I'm driving back and forth. There's a truck that we leave at 2 a.m. on a Tuesday to go into New York City. We pick up our stuff somewhere in Jersey, we deliver the furniture, you know, some big ass desks and whatnot in the in the city, driving in the city. Then we're heading back to Connecticut in traffic. And I get a call and it's sort of late in the season and the Patriots want to sign me because they have an injury and they want to resign me. And, uh, and I said, that's great. And I've been training, obviously I've been training with you and uh, with, uh, with coach Morris. And then uh, about 20 minutes after that, like, well, they're going to sign me. So 20 minutes later, they get, I get another call and they ask if I'm, if I'm in shape and all this other, like they seem re- very reticent. So, um, I said, no, of course, this is what I've been doing. I've been training. I've been going with Mark Hartzell. I've been training with Mike Morris. By the way, Mark uh, Hartzell I'm was a, my... I'm sorry to interrupt, Sean. Mark Hartzell was no, no a big-time uh, Brockton quarterback from a legendary superpower football program at high school. He played at Boston College, and he mm-hmm. also started games for the Chicago Bears. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Pretty good. Um, and, the, and Patriots. And uh, I thought, but um, so... I'm, I'm driving back and they, they call a second time and they're, they're sort of they're, they're, they have this they're sort of a suspicious tone and I, I'm like yeah I'm in the best shape of my life all I've been doing is training I'm healthy and I'm ready to play so um, and then they say okay great 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 so then they call back and like another half an hour and say you know what we're just gonna 
sit tight right now and um, we'll get in touch with your agent we'll, and uh, we'll call you, um, you know, in a day or two, maybe after, maybe after the weekend. And so I'm driving back up and I'm, I'm, I'm not like upset or anything. I'm just sort of confused and, uh, and I'm thinking that maybe this had something to do with the way that I ended my time with, uh, with the Patriots and you know this is what they call a CLM a career limiting move and if I had the opportunity maybe I should someday apologize to, to Scott Pioli but they he, they sent me to NFL Europe for the second time as a defensive back and and obviously you remember because I we played against each other in the World Bowl where Berlin beat us and I was playing defensive back and the smart ass quarterback said the road to this you know world bowl goes through 24 because i'm <laughs> a receiver playing corner oh, <laughs> and i made sure like he didn't complete any passes on me yeah. um i was played a good game but uh, regardless you, you, that's up to you guys you play a great game um uh, so so i'm driving back on i-95 well let me tell you the story so when i got released from the patriots um, that year when I came back from NFL Europe, Scott Pioli, the general manager who had essentially allocated me to NFL Europe to play defensive back for Coach Belichick to be the you know seventh defensive back and fifth or sixth wide receiver on a roster to save roster spots and then go play special teams and be able to go back up both ways. Um, he, he had told the coach that um, he told me before I left that I could play both offense and defense, but the coach told me when I got there that they told me that no, I'm not allowed to play offense. I'm only allowed to play defense. And so I felt like he didn't tell the truth. And so when I went in to co speak with Coach Belichick when I was released, Coach Belichick went in first. I went in second, and because Mr. Pioli was behind me, and I grabbed the other side of the uh, the doorknob and pulled it shut while he was trying to pull the door open to come in. I closed it on him. So I think that sort of that was my career career limiting move <laughs> so, so wait, 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 you shut Scott the door Pioli in coach definitely... belichick's face no and, and scott pioli's i was he was uh... coming in the both of them were going to talk to me and i didn't respect the fact that i felt like i was lied to and misled understood but and i thought yeah because when i got back to training camp i spent like a day on defense and then i was back as a receiver and um yeah, so let me, uh, I digress. Uh, the point is, I'm driving back on 95, and realizing, like, all right, so Scott Pioli really doesn't want me here because I really insulted him, and I shouldn't have done that, but I was uh, a little bit of a hothead. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Just when you get bit. cut, you're not necessarily always that rational, and I was pissed off. So um, so I, I ended up pulling in, like, it's not an 18-wheeler, but this is a pretty big-ass truck. And I pull it in and I park it in front. And the guy in the front of the um, in the front of the parking lot, whoa, whoa, you can't park this in. Get out of here. <laughs> and I hop out of the truck in a Muldoon's uh, moving T-shirt. And he's like, Sean, what the hell are you, what are you doing? I said, well, Coach Belichick's called. Maybe there's a chance they might sign me. And I just need, I need to have a conversation with him before I I was just I was just driving by, and uh, so he. <laughs> so I, is, I mean, it looks ridiculous. So I get can't this, make like, any of this up. I can't. I get this like moving T-shirt on and Muldoon's trucking, and anyway, the guys in the truck are laughing like, "Oh my God, Sean, what are you doing? This is you should not be here." Like, just call the guy, and <laughs> so they 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 sort of phoned in from the booth to Coach Belichick and. They told me to go in, and I sat down with Coach Belichick, and he said, it tells me a lot. I really respect you. I respect the hell out of you. It tells me a lot that you're here and that you're ready to play, but we're going to hold off this weekend. And I think they ended up, after the weekend, they signed David Gibbons. That's um, right. And they went right. on to win the Super Bowl. That's right. That's right. Um, Coach Belichick's and, a legit guy like that. I mean, I mean, when when I was actually released from the Jets, he actually, everyone was kind of cut and sent out the door. He actually had a conversation with me. And I really appreciate it. It was really, uh, it served me for the rest of my career, which was very short, but he was a um, very stand-up guy. And it was um, absolutely really appreciated. People don't know that. They think just because he's curt or standoffish with the media, that's what he does. That's not really who he is. Right. And I, th I think it's also, it would be fair to say, to go a step further to say, 
you know, of course, like at that point, you need to be at arm's length to be non emotional. You have to be. Um, you have to about, be. About making roster decisions on your team. But in the end, if it's really in the best interest of the team, then he has the, he, he, he retains his, his, um, you know, his morality he retains his his uh, his position in terms of he's making the best decision for the team in the long run and um, to win games and to do the job that he's asked to do. So if he's exactly. doing the job that, exactly. that he's been hired to do, how can you fault him? And he doesn't he doesn't owe you an explanation, but he oftentimes gives you feedback that helps. Uh, yeah, and I I respected that. Right, and, and I think that's why. You know, in the world we live in today, it's so challenging because everyone wants an explanation. They want to explain why. It's like, look, if they, if you can't serve the team and you're not adding great value, they just escort you to the door. I mean, that's kind of the use, the world we live in. I'm not saying that that's okay, and and the world has changed significantly, but that's the, really the world in pro football even today, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I agree. I- I've always think, thought of it as like a, a Darwinian meritocracy. Like, there's no there, there's no room for um, for anybody that isn't uh, contributing and adding value. Mm-hmm. And if someone else can add more value, then you know that's on you to have to have adapted or developed or been self aware enough to, to make sure that you're working on what you need to do so you don't get replaced. Right. I mean, it's very very uh, it's ultra cutthroat it is what it is i mean people mm-hmm. and I, and as i explain to people well, we have a, our team at anatomy we have a wonderful organization uh many extremely valuable team members and contributors i say you know think about showing up to your job every day knowing that you might be sent home and you can never go back ever how do you feel about that well <laughs> additionally the only thing you've ever wanted to do since you were 12 right. is the, in the way that you identify yourself worth is sort of tied to that profession, which you end up learning as you transition. Right, right. But like, it, it wasn't anything that, it wasn't who I was. It was just, you know, obviously people understand and they realize at some point, oh, that's just what I did and I did it really well and I worked really hard and that's why I was successful, but that's mm-hmm. not who I was. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, um, so, you know, Sean, you leave, you are, you don't get signed by the Patriots, then what happens? So I'm not signed by the Patriots, but at, at that point in time, um, I had been... Uh, Giants, right? So, Well, no, not the Giants. So I, I go and I do a, um, I'm trying to think of the years. And I think, I think the following year, or, or that particular year, I'm uh, I, I do a workout for the Eagles, and then if it's not that year, it's the following year. But well, let me ask Rod you a question. Smart. Let me ask you a question. You, I thought you signed a contract with the Giants, but then they actually tore it up because the Eagles were going to put you on the active roster. Um, no, I was at, I had a workout with the Giants at one point. With, um, I was supposed to go with and, and um, work out for the Giants and Dave Gettleman, but that's that, that was literally um, um, right before 9-11. That was the Monday. That, uh, on a, I was supposed to work out on a Tuesday before the Monday. It was 9-11. And so I knit, but that was the only talks I've had with the Giants. I think maybe what you're thinking of is the LA Avengers, and I, I ended up tearing up the, 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 I didn't report to training camp for the Avengers, and I went to NFL Europe for the Eagles for the third time came in and finally made a team but just before that i think really around the time that i was trying to get um to sign with the patriots with this uh muldoon's trucking thing i worked out later that uh, a month later for the eagles and then during the playoffs when rod smart was injured um he, you remember he hate me from the xfl of rod course smart, of course he's a great running back and um he was a special teams guy he, he's amazing um, and I had a really good workout for the Eagles, and they signed me. And I played against uh, what was it, Tampa Bay, Chicago, and then we lost to St. Louis. And St. Louis went on to play the Patriots. <laughs> that was, you know, the year before. Right. I went to, um, yeah, yeah. So that was when we lost to the um, 
we lost to the uh, to the Rams. The Rams go on to play the Patriots. That's their first Super Bowl win. That summer, I stay with the Eagles, get cut, go up to NFL, go up to Montreal with you, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, oh, with Kara, and while Kara is um, Kara Sean's wife, by the way. Yeah. So so yeah, that's the thing. I I come back and then. Um, so we play so 2003 is when i play those uh so I, I just play three games for the for the eagles then i go to canada and then i go back down for europe for the third time then i play for the eagles the entire season and then so the following season essentially i'm playing because i'm up there in 2002 not playing any football so 2002 i was basically i was i was out of football that i do not get credit for that season i was but I was the Alouette super fan. And so 2003, I play and we lose to Carolina and Carolina goes on to play who the Patriots. So like in two years in a row, I am a, or two, you know, um, Super Bowls, um, we just miss. And then I go to, um, uh, and then, and then next training camp, I'm released and, when I'm released, Miami Dolphins had a, uh, signed me off waivers. So I, I was packing in New Jersey to go down to Miami and play for the Dolphins. But then the, uh, the Steelers picked up um, my contract. And because they had a 6-10 and 10 record, I went to the Steelers instead and ended up playing for um, Bill Cower and uh, special teams coach Kevin Spencer for three years for the Steelers. That's when we were able to win a uh, Super Bowl my second year there against the Seahawks. And um, and, and Ken Wisenhunt, who was the offensive and Sean coordinator. Was, and Sean was a captain of that team, special teams captain. Right. But there, I mean, like, uh, I, there were so many great special teams players. I, I was a captain for the, the second year and third year, but we had so many guys. I mean, we had Brett Keys, we had James Harrison, Chidi Awoma, Clint Crewald. Clint Crewald was one of the best special teams players I've ever played with and um we had just an, an amazing team like you, you talk about a culture of of players where everybody is singularly focused on one aim and that's simply you know not not just to win but like on each other like helping each other win games like we would even help coach each other in practice like you're competing and then you're talking and compete and and coaching each other like it was it was, it was just a, a type of dynamic that like everybody was solely invested in helping each other get better coaches mm -hmm. players owners it was really a special place right um would you say sean that was the best culture that you've ever been a part of no doubt yeah and and, and maybe it maybe and maybe it started with like guys like joey porter and jerome bettis and heinz oh, yeah. ward i mean i could go on i mean everybody there you can almost name the entire team and say oh yeah yeah, definitely. Like they were just, and I, I don't know if it's a, if it's a testament to to Bill Cower or really honestly, not just Bill Cower but Dick LeBeau and Russ Grimm. I mean, you know, Alan Stanica, Troy Palomalu. All these people like played and loved. The, we played for each other because it was it was one of the best cultures. Yeah, it was a, it was a it was a great team atmosphere, and a lot of that stemmed from sort of the mom and pop type feel, mm -hmm. like the close knit family sense that you got from from the Roonies because it was it was in you know sort of a small town in Pittsburgh that it's a it's a city of course but it, it's sort of contained from the outside you know it, it feels like people from Pittsburgh are, right. you know, are, are devotely you know Pittsburghers you know um I'll tell you, Dick LeBeau is a special man. I got to play for him in Cincinnati. He was a great, great, great man, a great coach, mm -hmm. great person, super smart, like way ahead of his time. Like, and he, I think he coached in the NFL for fifty some plus years. He was coaching a coordinator mm -hmm. at, at seventy plus years, like maybe seventy three. Yeah, I think he played for four, fourteen or something yeah. like that he, before he, he coached he, him. He is a tough son of a gun, man. Oof, you know very what? Tough. I, I'm sorry to interrupt no, you. But I, I don't want to forget my thought, but I, I can honestly say the the way that I practice, of course, like you want to get better and you want to make an impression and have a build-in opportunity to play more. Of course, I wanted to play more, 
but like I felt like the effort that I gave on scout team was sort of the way that I could communicate my respect and appreciation for what for the type of person he is and the way he coaches mm -hmm. and um, so like the only really way I could communicate that is through because I knew that that guy was watching practice he watched every rep practice. oh yeah and if he sees me hauling ass and he sees me working hard and making guys better and competing then he's gonna realize that I'm you know I'm one worth of those it. guys type worth thing. it yeah, yeah it's worth it yeah right? for sure for sure so uh, after football um, with the Steelers, you go to Arizona, correct? Right. I was. Uh, I, I finally became. A, I was a, became a free agent, and um, I decided to go to uh, Arizona with Ken Wisenhunt and um, Kevin Spencer, who's my special teams coach. And Russ Grimm was going as well. And and honestly, I I, I remember, um, you know. Um, it was, it was it wasn't an easy decision i'll say that mm -hmm. um, but I, I i felt like i rationally i i, I believed that you know with, with a, a being becoming a new co i mean maybe this is somewhat transactional mm -hmm. um but there there's a number of things that you have to consider when you're a free agent like number one is like like career longevity and and I realized that if I stayed in Pittsburgh with a new coaching staff, like there's a chance that they have their own guys and they don't, they don't think I'm as valuable. And I realized that if I stayed in Pittsburgh as well, I, I would, if I played however many years I played, I would look back and I'd think like everything was, it was sort of blend together. I wouldn't be able to sift out which year, but I felt like obviously Arizona would be a new experience for myself and my family, but also, um, uh, you know, if a new coach is bringing players in, um, it's really hard. And, and I, you know what, I mean, like, like there's a transactional way that I almost like cringe when I think about it. And I think, well, you can't really get cut the first year they bring you in. If they're going to sign you as a free agent and they like, so at least I'm going to get one year right. in Arizona. So that's sort of a calculus of it. But on top of that, which is very genuine, is I really deeply loved and respected my special teams coach. Mm -hmm. And I felt like there is a, a, a sense of loyalty. And I, I, when I played, I played, I played for him. And I knew that there was like, if anything was ever going to happen, at least that would, he would be honest with me. Right. And right, right. Um, that's sometimes that's all you can ask for. And, uh, and coach Wisenhunt was great. Like I wasn't a very good receiver, but when I, when I played, if something happened where I, I chipped on a route or came out of a break and didn't look fast enough. And Ben had like thrown a ball and it came bounced off my face mask or something in practice. Like he would laugh and he'd run it back and practice and, and, and film. And like, he helped me not take myself too seriously. So I actually played a lot better for coach Wisenhunt because of his demeanor. Right. And I felt like his, I really liked his, his offense. And I was, I knew his offense and I could, I could really be plugged into any position and not miss a beat. I feel like what you so just said, was... what you just said, Sean, it speaks volumes. Like you, you look in the NFL, there's pressure everywhere. There's, there's pressure for days. There's no shortage of pressure, but they know that, right? Like if you can have guys that take their work seriously, but they don't take themselves too seriously and they can, uh, it's not like just, Hey, have fun because it's a business, but you know, he took some pressure off your shoulders and you paid that back tenfold because you played better. That's a big deal. Right. That's a really big deal. And I think good coaches, so yeah, they can identify that. And that's what makes him a great leader and a good coach. Mm -hmm. Like just, it's kind of like people need to recognize when to show gratitude, when to highlight a person and when to let others know like they're doing a great job. And I think, Look, I'm, it's not all about praise. You need to give feedback as well, constructive feedback. But I think that lesson, Sean, that took a little bit of pressure off to get more out of you, he could see that. And I think that's a special thing. And that goes a long way. Mm -hmm. so, and, and, and don't get me wrong either. Like, I, like I, I feel like I would, would pride myself um, through college and pros. Like, I'm no stranger to being dog cussed or mf and and like that's sort of part of the, the, the you know um i don't know uh 
what's I don't know how I, I would say it, but like that that is part of your the maturation process as a competitive athlete. You have to be able to have not it's not about thick skin. It's about being objective and realizing that that the criticism you that you're getting and reg- regardless of the form, regardless of how aggressive or um or demeaning it is, it's still intended to benefit the team. It's still intended for people to get better, to improve, to do it correctly, to not screw up again, so to speak. And, you know, like when you realize that coaches are human too, and they, they, they have this unbelievable, like you talk about stress all day long, like this coach, like I've been coaching for eight years and, and I don't, I actually, I do a pretty good job. I don't yell. Maybe I need to yell more. But I, I feel like, you know, there's a time and place for teaching and analyzing. And then there's a time and place for, you know, screaming and like, listen, we got to get this done now. Right, right. And um, I think I've been one of the things I've been able to do over a long period of time while I played was. Um, and I, I guess I wasn't really prompted with this question, but I, I'm sort of um, uh, I, I'm, I'm inferring that part of your podcast is trying to understand how, you know, how, how do people persevere through, you know, challenges? And yeah, I was cut a lot. I mean, I remember carrying a bag of all my sneakers and stuff out of the Patriots locker room with guys looking at me and me like just tearing up and, you know, like a grown man crying as he walks out with his bag of crap and a plastic and a plastic trash bag Mm -hmm. from his hometown team. No one like, that might be the last time I ever set foot in an NFL locker room to, you know, winning a Super Bowl, losing a Super Bowl, going to a Pro Bowl, having th- the birth of my three daughters. I mean, there's life has a lot of ups and downs. There's, and, and, and Coach Cowell would say, I've been flow, you know, but you, it's the, the people are successful because they never, I, I, and I apologize if I, maybe you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I would appreciate it. Be critical. But I think it's it's the iterative process of being um, selfless, humble, uh, self-aware, and being able and willing to adapt to stress and pressure and and constructive criticism. Right? Like you're always trying to get better, and, reg- and whether you did a great job or whether you you know pissed on your leg, you still have to analyze that, mm-hmm. um, examine like you're the, how you did it and is there a better way to do this and i think that's i was capable of i was i was i was fortunate to have a lot of good coaches that believed in me and people in my life that helped me figure that stuff out because nobody can do it on their own but you still at the end you have to be willing to do the work right um, so I, I would i mean that was very well said i, I think that it all stems back and everything goes back to ego you know and you know, we talk about, um, you know, check your ego, check your ego. But I'll tell you, man, my my egos and, and my ego is still, still very uh, active, and and it gets the best of me at, at times. And I think it's very hard for you to say. Like, I had an issue today with a young man. Uh, when I say issue, like he was going through something, and he was very upset at something, and. You know, when you look at it at 30,000 feet, it was very small. But he couldn't understand how he was going to get through it. And I was saying, look, this, on the cusp of things, this is super small. And if you let something as small as this deter you, every time something like this happens, you're not going to get through the day. You have to check your ego and say, look, what was my role in this? How can I learn from it? How can I be better next time? And know that you might be having a bad day but you're not having a bad life. Does that make sense? Like, mm-hmm. just understand that you can work through things. You, you can, everything you can work through. And it's very, very hard when you're going through it. Man, it, some things trigger me and set me off. And I go, I look back, you're such an idiot. Why did you handle it like that? <laughs> but look, that's, that's a part of growing up. And you, and you grow up at 15, 25, 35, and now I'm 45. And I'm going to get a lot of growing up to do. And we're all the same way. There's moody people. There's people who say negative things, passive aggressive things, have crappy attitudes, and you just got to do your best to improve those small, small behaviors that are negative in our life. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And 
Absolutely. Um, isn't it, isn't it amazing how like your your own pride or ego can self sabotage? I, I wouldn't even say self sabotage. Like, you can sabotage like your um not just the work you do, but the I don't know. I'm basically trying to interpret the experience I had this past season coaching where it was probably similar to like my rookie season as a Patriot, you know, I made, as a, Oh God, it actually does. So when I was a rookie, the, I made the, the team, I played two games. I didn't play the two games in the beginning of the season. I, uh, I was, I was inactive and then I was put on the practice squad and we were there together. It was, it was enervating. Like we're practicing so hard, trying to earn respect and credibility and trying to get on the roster. To play oh, yeah. the games. And this season as a coach, I mean, I've got, I don't know. I can't even tell you how many, if, if I counted the number of years I've played or coached, it's over 30 and um, easily. And, you know, after the second week of the season, the, that new head coach um, took away my, my my you know change, took care of my role as an offensive coordinator he wanted to call the plays and maybe and in, in hindsight i i i was teaching things to the high school players that they weren't yet ready to um execute mm-hmm. and i was i was i was not i was not communicating well enough at at a pace that that um that ensured that everybody would be on the same page. Mm-hmm. They just weren't on the same page, and it was my fault. And so he took over, and it was a, it was a good. It was probably a good. I can't fault him for making a coaching decision because the, as a head coach, you have to make those tough decisions. However, the way he communicated, which I uh, did not communicate it, was really tough for me to handle because it, it speaks to character and leadership. And um, so I, I in turn did. What I, I adapted, and I felt like I had to, I did what I needed to do to support him as a head coach, to, because in the end, it was still all about the team. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't change what I did this season or how I, how I um, managed it, but I learned a really difficult lesson, a hard lesson in like humility and being prepared, over prepared for any season, regardless of what level you're coaching, so that everybody's on the same page. Because if one guy's not on the same page, Everything can fall apart, and they can blame you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sure um, you the, the the parallels there, are like from playing to coaching. Everyone thinks coaching is easy. Like people really do believe coaching is easy, unless you've been a player, unless you've been a coach, and unless you've dealt with 50, 60, 70, 80 athletes, where you have to reel it in and get them to actually perform and produce and get them all on the same page. Good luck with that. I see five people in an office who can't get along. I'm like, five people can't get along. Try 80 guys in a locker room who are all from different backgrounds, who all like different music, who all have different tastes in food, who all have different political views, they're different religious views, but they all get along. How, how can that be? It's crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of uh, powerful learning lessons. So well, sh- let me ask you a question. How do you, how do your coaches, because like, I, I would assume that you your trainers – do you call them coaches? They're body architects. Okay. Like what what is what do you what are some of the things that you do that to instill like a, a more collaborative culture supporting each other? So uh, we do we you know we, weekly meetings are kind of the foundation of it. Those weekly meetings are um, we give them the stage. We allow them to participate. We have them they work on presentations, they do life stories of themselves. Uh, we want them on Front Street so they can work on their public speaking skills. Um, we want them to be, they're all leaders. We have people in specific leadership roles, but they're all leaders. And they have to understand that because you're all leaders, uh, you're going to be a part of these decisions. And that we need to get something done. Hey, guys, how do we do this? What's the best way to get this done? And they all have an active say in it. They really do. That doesn't mean we're going to do everything they say, but it means that if there's something of value, they just became a part of the process, but they're always a part of the process. Um, you know, you, we're in- what if somebody feels like they're not part of the process and they're, they're being um, carved out? Mm-hmm. Well, that's great. Two things. Um, 
Uh, great question. Number one, is it is it stemming from their personality or their uh, a behavioral issue that they're dealing with and they're bringing things in from the past where certain things are triggers and they walk around with a constant feeling of feeling underappreciated? That's one thing. The other thing is, how would you like to contribute? What's important to you? How would you like to be a more integral part of this? Hey, I want Mark, I want to be in a leadership role or I want to do this. That's great, but you can't even show up on time. You see what I'm saying? Like, if you have the skills and you've demonstrated that you have all the things and done all the things and taken all the steps necessary to lead by example, be a great performer and be productive for the company and set a positive example, and we call it the anatomy way, well, then we're going to have that conversation. And we're certainly going to try to find a home for you doing something that if we have that role, why not? If we don't have that role, that's another conversation. Um, but it starts with conversation, Sean, having a conversation and trying to figure out why, do, why don't you feel like you're a part of this process? Like if we hired you to be a body architect, which is what our trainers are called, um, and you don't want to do that, well, then that's we have to have a conversation about why you chose to be in a place and you don't want to do the role that you were hired for. Um, now, that, that role could certainly evolve, but that'll take time. You know, I feel to get opportunities, you make your opportunities based off your competency, production, performance, and behavior. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. So, Sean, I don't want to monopolize all your time, although I feel like I already have. <laughs> but I do want to ask you a few quick questions. Number one... Uh, your favorite team that you ever played Wait, for? Wait, did, did you say quick questions or did you ask for quick answers? Uh, I said quick questions and quick, um, okay. quick Fair answers. Enough. Yeah, thank you. That's a great, great, great follow up. Best your the team that you played for that you <laughs> loved that experience the most would that be the Steelers? You know, I can't honestly. I can't. I can't say one is better than the other. It's just not. It's not possible. Oh, it's because there's there's so many people, there's so many relationships. Is that a cop out? Yeah, it's a cop out. It's a cop out. Got right. one. Got um, a gun to your head. Um, Steelers. Okay. Relationships you. are really. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Your favorite coach. You know, it's going to break the heart of one of my favorite, one of my favorite friends and coaches and one of the best people I know in football, Kevin Spencer. But my favorite coach, even though I've had many amazing coaches, is uh, is John Harbaugh. Wow, that's impressive. Um, why Harbaugh? He's, you know, I think, I think from... You know, his dad was a coach. His, you know, Jim Harbaugh played and coach. John was my coach, my special teams coach in Philadelphia, and he was hard on me, mm -hmm. and uh, coached the hell out of me. We we were we ended up being the number one special teams unit in two thousand three, um, and he helped me learn how to play the game. And this past summer, I know, and I can't keep in touch with a lot of the, the coaches that I, I played for. B A obviously is, is another coach that was awesome. He was my receivers coach in Pittsburgh. Um, awesome dude. And, uh, but John, John Harbaugh you, is, is sort of uniquely, um, adept at like, you know, the, his interpersonal skills and the way that he treats teams and, and, uh, people like he's, he's a, he's a leader. He's an empathetic servant leader. He sort of embodies that. He understands like he, he a lot of his decisions I, I feel are based on his like you know really strong principles. And he never he never shies away from sort of questioning and, and analyzing like how things are done. And I think he's he's sort of a sort of a true coach and and a, a true friend. And um just an, an honest guy, really a stand up guy. Understood. Understood. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, mm -hmm. Sean, if you could give a young person a tip about following their dream 
and giving them advice and I know this is so broad what advice would you give them uh, in in regards to they're following they're on a journey they're following their dreams they're chasing their dream rather and they're trying to achieve something at a high level to them whatever it may be what advice mm-hmm. would you give them don't be discouraged it's easy it's easy to um, fall in the trap of uh, you know when you when you get disappointed or you miss your mark like that, that's part of the process you have to fail you have to fail in order to succeed because the, the 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 process of failing over and over helps you learn how to be successful I mean I can't say it any other way you you have to fail do not be afraid to fail you got to go after it to do it go after whatever it is that you're passionate about as much as you can and and as hard as you can prepare do do your due diligence um you know i said earlier a, a quote that really should be um should be uh g- given credit to uh, uh carl lewis where john lewis john lott was a strength coach in arizona and he used to train carl lewis and he asked Carl Lewis one time, you know, what is it that made you so successful? And he said, I, I never wanted it to be something I didn't do that caused me to fail. And I mean, that, that, that's sort of how you approach things, right? You, you approach it that way. That's how you start. And then when you fail and you get discouraged or if you're disappointed, like that's supposed to happen. You learn from it and you become better. And, you know, I'm actually dealing with this now in, in my situation as a coach trying to understand and analyze what I can do better next year. And, and I, I recently just read a quote and said, uh, uh, disappointments, or I should say any disappointment um, is an assignment for your next appointment. And meaning, right? Like it's like, if you're disappointed or something didn't work or go the way you wanted, that's your homework. Go figure it out. Do it better because you're going to get another chance and you, you need to be ready for that. Oh, I love that. That's a great, great, great quote, great insight and great perspective. Thank you so much, Sean, man. I, I can't thank you enough for your time. Um, we're going to do another podcast where we're going to talk about every single thing that we went through off the field. And that will have to be uh, in in <laughs> and no, we're not. <laughs> and I think we're gonna have what we're gonna do is we'll, we'll say is Joe Douglas gonna come on? Yeah, uh, Joe Douglas is not allowed to open the vault anymore because <laughs> so oh wow, Joe Douglas. Wow, I wasn't even thinking about Delaware, but that can be a whole nother podcast. Um, yeah. So, but I will say we gotta we gotta, we gotta start paying people off. Yeah, Barry good. Taylor and oh man. We can bring a, Elio, Elio and Bernoni, Dave Cooney. <laughs> <laughs> it would hey, be how great. You know what though? Uh, I really appreciate you, you you asking me to come on. It was nice to reminisce and talk a little bit. And uh, you know, um, I, I, I love I love what you're doing. I think that I'm really. I read some of the testimonials on your web page about the Magna Method, and honestly. Uh, I'm not trying to plug you, but now it seems like I am plugging you. So now I'm going to have to, which is, you know, I can't imagine. I've I've been around and I've played with a lot of great athletes. I've played and, and I know a lot of, you know, really, to be honest, like, you know, Hall of Fame coaches and people and individuals. And I've I have yet to find anyone, not one single person that I can sit here with a straight face. And I know you can't see my face. But to be completely honest, that I've ever seen work harder than Mark Magna. And yeah. I think that's, uh, you know, you invest in people. You invested in me when I went back to NFL Europe, you know, and I was, you know, that was my last opportunity, that chance to make it. And you trained me to get ready to go back to NFL Europe. And I had the, I had the, the best season of my life in NFL Europe that third time. And I made it, and I ended up, I ended up playing in 33 straight games, games thanks to Mark Magna. Well, so know. let's, I mean, we can put a lot of things in perspective, but um, if I can do anything, I just want to say thanks, Mark. Well, Sean, yeah, thank you for saying that. But Sean Mori is a uh, extraordinary person. No, no, we can also... we can leave. Me, I can have the last no, word. No, no, no. He's an extraordinary <laughs> worker in 
I could tell you stories for days, but this guy who is a great athlete, but, you know, when he's standing next to Larry Fitzgerald, who's 6'5", 230 pounds, and flies and a legendary receiver, may not look like that, but when you talk about overachiever, there is he his picture's in the dictionary right next to her overachiever. Sean, you're a blessing as a friend and uh, to the athletes that you work with now. Um, please give my best to carrying the kids and love you, brother. Thank you for doing this. All right. Thank you, everybody. I love you. All right. Talk to yeah. you soon. Okay. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.